Hey guys, it's Susie, and in tonight's video, we're going to talk about some very nitty-gritty practical ways that even if you've tried the Flip Classroom before, you can do it with Canvas, with Fidelity, without pulling your hair out. So stay tuned. So I'm certainly not the expert on flipped learning, but guess what? I have done it. I would not make a video on something I had never tried before, and I have real results, both the good and the bad, so stay tuned on that. But my definition of flipped learning is this, okay? It's where you take your direct instruction, the stuff where you'd have to do Charlie Brown's teacher, like mom, 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 in front of the class. You try to, you do try to jazz it up a little bit, but that's something that kids can watch outside of class. Or if you skip down to bullet four, we'll talk about synchronous and asynchronous. But that direct content where you're like, you know, this is something that would really translate well to video, the kids can watch on their own, and then it saves room for remediation with me in class. They get that teacher time. Again, I'm going to give some examples in a minute. Or that enrichment or that time to work with other people, social learning. Now, I want to go back up to bullet two. These kind of all tie together, which is why I'm sort of out of order. But flipped learning doesn't have to be video. You could give kids an article to read, and that can be so appropriate if you're a social studies teacher doing a document-based question, or you're an English teacher that wants to focus on close reading. Awesome, you can give them text. But let me say, think about your own learning. When I go on Instagram, I'm not so much reading the posts anymore. I am going on Instagram stories. I prefer the video content. And you know, obviously I'm on YouTube, so I like video there. So it doesn't have to be video, just use video if it fits because it is a very engaging platform. And then skipping down to bullet four now back there, if you're in a virtual world, when I say flip inside and outside of class, just think of it as synchronous. We're together, that's our in-class time. Asynchronous is when I would typically do the flip, except I'm gonna give you some stories on the next slide where you can think about that, see how it might translate to this virtual world. And I would honestly love to hear this is a topic where I'm really interested to hear how you're making this work in the virtual world or in the, um, you know, the hybrid model or whatever you're doing. I would love to hear your comments below because I feel like there's so many ways to take this. So we're going to now transition into me talking about how I did some flipping in my classroom, what happened with it, and some trial and error tips I have along the way. I've heard the words terribly honest used, and I feel terrible for being honest here, but anyway... My flipped learning journey started because I had to teach Shakespeare. I taught Shakespeare for four years, and every year I taught it, it never got better to, <laughs> this is so bad, it never got better to hear students read Romeo and Juliet out loud. It's not that I don't think they should read it. Absolutely, they should read it. Shakespearean language is where we get a lot of our language. I'm an English teacher, for goodness sake. However, it's not something that necessarily kids need to read the whole thing out loud. So I definitely believe you don't have to flip everything. What I did was, as there are five acts in a lot of Shakespeare's plays, and so specifically Romeo and Juliet, I let the students read Act 1, but as they were reading it, I was moonlighting, and at night I was using a ridiculous app called Sock Puppets. Y'all, this is so embarrassing. And uh, I was making them little videos of each of the next acts and scenes. So, for example. Alas, alas, help, help, my lady's dead. So this app is called Sock Puppets. <laughs> and my husband's like, what are you doing? Because I would sit in bed at night and I would record these little sock puppet videos. So you tap it, you tell it which direction to turn, and sometimes I would forget and turn it the wrong way, and then I was trying to make different voices. So anyway... I recorded, for example, you can see that this is act four, scenes four and five, and that some of my kids watched it. But anyway, they would watch the video, and then I pasted in closed captions for them. It's the good thing is about Romeo and Juliet, that you can find a transcript of it everywhere, and it's copyright friendly. So I pasted in closed captions, so they're listening to it while they're watching the captions. So I'll just play that another second. Oh, where a day that ever I was born. Aquavitejo. Okay. So anyway, I wanted them to see the language, but also hear the language. And so the first step was they were supposed to um, go on and watch this video every night. They were mostly short. So this one's 10 minutes covering two scenes, which is a lot faster than we would have read it in class. And then they would do some type of Padlet response at the time. That's what I was using. I don't want to show because it actually reveals their names, but they would go on Padlet and do some kind of interactive response. And they would also have a quiz on Socrative. So I was using three tools back then because guess what? I didn't have Canvas. So I'm going to give you some 
tips on making this very practical. You can actually do all the things I just did in Canvas uh, without having to go anywhere else. So uh, I would have them watch the video, interact with it in some way, and then take a quiz just to make sure they understood. I knew they were taking the quiz at home, so I knew they probably were getting help, but honestly, if they understood the content, that was my main goal, okay? It wasn't that kind of a quiz, and I was a, a difficult teacher, so uh, don't worry that I, um, you know, was making things too fluffy or too easy, but they got to watch it with these little silly backgrounds and puppets, which was lots of fun for me. I did upgrade to the paid version, so if you just get inspired by this, even though this isn't the point of the video, if you want to get um, the Sock Puppets app, I did upgrade to the paid version. Anyway, all of that to say, that was my flipped learning plan. But what did I do if students did not do the work they were supposed to do? What was my plan for them then? Well, I'm going to show you something that I really changed it as time went on. But I gave them basically a form that says, I forgot to flip their name, what they forgot to do, blah, 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 and the date. So if the other kids came in that next day, well, I had already looked at all of the quiz scores on Socratic, okay? And I grouped kids, kids who got an A or a B went into the, and I have a lesson plan on this that I can pull up in just a minute, but kids who got an A or a B moved into a social learning activity. So for example, they might do a pow tune on scene two if they already showed that they, or act two if they showed that they understood it. And that could take a few days. Kids who got a medium or, or got a failing grade, like a C or below, so C or F, um, they would actually come do an activity with me. And you would think that would embarrass kids or they wouldn't like it, but y'all, they really enjoyed being in the group with me. I think it was because ninth graders, it's been a while since they were pulled into any kind of a center for teacher interaction. And that's sad. Uh, I know my elementary folks who are the majority of who watches this channel, y'all are the queens and kings of you know, small groups and wearing your reading crown and, you know, doing all those kind of things. But we don't often do it in high school. So what I, so the kids who got to be with me, even though they had a failing grade, I did some kind of an interactive activity on the smart board or whatever. You could do that on your, on your Teams live meeting or on your Google meet or on your Zoom call, but some kind of an activity that you could do in a breakout room with those kids. And then the kids who did not do it at all are the ones who did this sheet. So they, so they had to go back and basically do the things that the other kids did in homework um, at school, okay? Now, I did end up taking this part out, so I'm not even going to talk about it, but let me show you what was kind of funny to me. <laughs> um, after the kids did the, uh, the flipped learning, I might still put them in my remediation group if they fail the quiz, so I, would, I might remediate two different times. But the kids who did well on it after they took it would just move, but they wouldn't have had time to start a whole activity after they did all this in class. So what they would do is I would have them observe another group and they would say who they were watching and then they would say what the directions were and then they would write a reflection on what the kids were doing, how they were helping each other, what the assignment had to do with the flipped learning, blah, blah, blah. And I'm happy to share this document. Um, if anybody wants it, just leave me a comment below. I don't want to share it if nobody wants it. Um, anyway, you could certainly modify it. But y'all, the kids were so funny. Where it says, what are the kids doing? They would say something like, John is now scratching his nose. He then turns to his neighbor and says, <laughs> and they would literally write me quotes. I wish, I wish I had saved some examples of these. I don't think I have any anymore. But it gave them something to do. They still got to be social because they were in a group, but they were not coming in in the middle of an activity and having less to do or having to get settled. So the motivation was there because they did not want to have to fill out this form more than once, and they wanted to be able to be social with a group. So it was built in interactivity and socialization. And so again, I'm going to just show you, I'm going to pause and show you my lesson plan, how I worded this for my principal. So even though I said this, I know it's helpful to look at. Um, so this is how I grouped my kids. Again, those who flipped and did well were in group one. Those who flipped but did not do well, group two. And then group three are the ones who did not flip in those same directions I just told you. And um, this was for act three of Romeo and Juliet. And so um, I talked to them about what they would do in each of those groups. But I just wanted you to see how I had it written down, okay? So group one was going to be recording the interview using the Sock Puppets app. So they were going to be um, going in and actually using my same app, which was a lot of fun, to get to record an interview. Group two was going to remediate the quiz, and then they actually were grouped up together to do that same activity. 
and then group three did the report I just told you because it was hard for them to get time between having to make up the flip and then remediation if necessary. They just went and watched another group. Okay, so that's how I structured mine. And again, I think it added structure, but also motivation. And I'm happy to share any of this you want. Just leave me a note in the comments and tell me what it is you'd like me to send your way. Even though that was a long segment, making this a little bit longer of a video, I, I feel like a lot of times people tell you to do something and it's very pie in the sky because they'll say, your kids will do it. They'll be excited. And you know, you have kids. It starts in element. I know a lot of you are elementary school, but I've met some elementary kids that aren't very excited. <laughs> and you can give me an amen from where you are. But even up to middle and high school, which I taught, um, you're going to capture some kids just who want to do and want to achieve. But when people tell you about flipped learning or any model, they don't really tell you what to do about the pitfalls. So I hope even though that was a little bit rambling, I hope me telling you specific examples of what to have your kids do will help you to form a framework. Now, here's the cool thing. The technology part you've got with Canvas, okay? I do not think you're probably going to be recording sock puppet videos all night, although you could if you wanted. You do you. But Canvas Studio is a place where you could upload a video like that, or you can actually pull in videos and add questions. I had a whole video on Canvas Studio a couple videos ago. I will try to link to that in the, the description box. Um, and then within Canvas, you also can use, instead of where I had to go out to Padlet or to Socrative, you can actually create discussions where students process the video and turn on that feature pro tip that says they can't reply or they can't see anybody else's replies till they reply first because otherwise they'll just say yeah I mean and they'll just write whatever but discussions or quizzes can help them process and then get graded on the content and then finally you have assignments so that's so flexible you can have them turn in anything to increase their accountability so you have everything that I didn't have back in the day I was using Edmodo and Padlet and uh, Socrative and you know creating things on the sock puppet app you have it all in one place that's one thing I love about Canvas this is kind of a different video. You saw my face more and demonstration in Canvas less, but I hope it got you thinking and I would love to hear, did you like this style of video? You know what to do. Leave me a comment below, like. If you haven't subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? Join my subscribe tribe. Take care. I'm a Christian, so I believe that saying that says, the verse that says, you have not because you ask not. So I'm asking you guys for a favor tonight. I would love to do more training. I know that a lot of you have been blessed by these videos. That's why you keep coming back. If you would love to have me in your school, I have a guide for you. I'm going to link it down in the comments below. It's actually not for you. It's for you to send to your leadership. So will you do that for me? Uh, just kind of, you know, tell them that you love my videos and you have a guide for them. Now I called the guide, the leader's guide to PD that doesn't suck. <laughs> my husband said, Susie, that's kind of a raucous term and I really did use it because we've all been in some PD that I mean there's no other word for it I thought it would get their attention and be funny so anyway if you wouldn't mind sending that to one of your leaders that is in charge of booking professional development I would love to be with you like for real in your school so take care just thought I'd ask you to do that for me